Look, we all know how important the command line is for developers, or at least you've heard someone say how important it is. The problem is you learn the basics, cd, ls, git commands, and then from there you're pretty much on your own. But you're still a long way from being Mr. Robot on the command line. After working at a tech company, here's five command line tricks I picked up that I wish I knew sooner. Keep in mind these tricks are for the Unix command line, which applies to Mac OS, as well as Linux. The first trick is to alias everything. So just to give some context, you might know about the .bashrc file. This is located in your home directory, and it holds all the settings for your terminal environment. These are specific to you as a user, so if you go in a new computer, you won't have these unless you copy them over. You might also know that within this file you can set aliases, that is custom commands, to do pretty much anything you want. I was using aliases pretty early on for the git commands. For example, setting git add to just ga saves you a lot of keystrokes, especially when you add up all the times you're typing that uh, over time. But it wasn't until I started to alias everything that my workflow really started to speed up. For example, common directory changes that I would do more than once a day, I would just change to cd and then two more letters. For example, cddk, change directory to desktop. It's at least four keystrokes less than auto-completing the home squiggly line slash desktop. So over time, I just like to think it saves me a lot. You can also open applications with aliases, for example, OGC, open Google Chrome, or VS Code actually gives you one for free, which is code, space, and then your file path to open it in VS Code. As a rule of thumb, if I use a command more than once a day, I'll consider making an alias for it. You might ask, are all these aliases hard to remember? Well, not necessarily, because you add them over time as you uh, need them, and then you just kind of naturally remember them because you're using them a lot. Trick number two, and this one is huge, to start using window stacking with your terminal. I'm not sure if this is only a feature in iTerm, but iTerm is an alternative terminal application that gives you uh, a little bit of more customization than the default terminal app. Within iTerm, you can open multiple windows in the same window that will automatically arrange themselves. Window stacking is super handy because you can see everything happening at once without switching between tabs or even worse, switching between windows. The hotkeys to open a new window to the right are command D and then you can open one below with command shift D. You can never get around with command option arrow keys and close a window with command W. Since starting to use this, I can never go back to just running single windows, and I think every developer should be using window stacking. The next one is super simple, and I'm a little ashamed it took me this long to figure it out, but it is turning Vim syntax highlighting on. Uh, Vim, if you don't know, is a command line text editor that you basically have to use if you're SSHing into a server that is not your local machine. Vim can also be super useful to quickly edit a file, especially if it's a config file or a script. Here's a one minute Vim tutorial. Vim can be opened with VI or VIM, followed by a file name. If the file doesn't exist, Vim creates a new file for you. Once you're in the file, there are two modes, navigation mode and edit mode. To switch between the two, you can hit I to enter edit mode and escape to return to navigation mode. Inside edit mode, you can type pretty much like a normal text editor. And when you're done, you want to hit escape. And then to run a command, colon W will save your file. Colon Q will quit the file. And then I can open it back up. And I can put WQ together to save and quit. A couple of other shortcuts are going to be O to enter insert mode with a new line. You can hit D twice to delete a whole line and slash followed by a string to search. Like the bash RC, Vim has its own dot file located in the home directory that may or may not already be created for you. If not, you can create it and simply in that file write syntax colon on. 
This will now syntax highlight all your files you open in Vim with vi space file. By turning this syntax highlighting on, you go from just a plain generic text file uh, type style editor and you get a lot of code highlighting for free. This makes it a lot easier to read code files and be able to just scan through them um, without having to go line by line and see what's happening. Vim purists might say the syntax highlighting on is for kids, but I think especially if you're starting out, having it on makes Vim a lot more approachable. Tip number four is another quality of life tip that just makes your life in the terminal easier. There's a small library that you have to install called JQ. So I'm here in the JQ docs and it's pretty easy to download JQ. You don't even need to come here. But if you're on Linux, you can run sudo apt get install JQ. And then for Mac, you can just run brew install. If you don't have brew for some reason, you can download the binary directly, but that's a little bit harder because you have to change permissions and then set up the path. Just don't worry about it. Just use brew. What JQ does is give you a lot of utilities around JSON in the terminal. If you want to pretty print a JSON file, all you have to do is JQ dot and then the file name. For comparison, here's what it looks like without the pretty printing. The package.json isn't too bad, but if we get unstructured JSON from either a log stream or a REST API response, things are a little bit more, let's just say, chaotic. JQ really starts to shine when you are able to pipe JSON responses with a Unix operator into the JQ utility. Here's what I mean. I'm going to start a server on the left and I'm just going to run a script I wrote that runs curl. So sending a request to a rest endpoint. You can see that this unstructured JSON, even though it's only an array of size two is already hard to read. So just imagine if this array was size of a hundred or more. Now, all I actually have to do is use the Unix pipe, the straight line, and pipe that into JQ. So my output is going into the input of JQ. You can see that this already looks a lot better because we have the color as well as the formatting. These are the most simple use cases for JQ, but there's actually a lot more you can do with it. I'll just add that you can also read a specific JSON property from a file. So if I wanted to read the scripts property from a package.json, I would just pass in dot scripts to JQ instead of just the dot. This can also go multiple levels deep, but I'll let you explore JQ more on your own. Tip number five, I sort of see the terminal like the developer's living room. A little housekeeping can go a long way and it's important to kind of like feel like it's your own, at least in my opinion, although that might sound dumb. <laughs> so the prompt that you type everything after in your terminal is also known as your PS1. By default, this is just kind of the current directory plus a dollar sign, but there's ways to customize it to put your own uh, personal mark on your terminal. I have to give a shout out to my coworker, Steven, for showing me this one. There's a site online where you can build a custom PS1 with different colors, your name, and just a lot of drag and drop settings to make it your own. Just by playing with this editor, it's pretty fun to kind of put your own personal brand on your terminal. Oh yeah, and when you're done, don't forget to paste it in your bash RC to have the settings update. That is pretty much it. I really wanna say if you know any terminal tricks that I didn't mention here, please leave a comment uh, with them so other people can see that too. Anyway guys, that's all I got today. Hope you have a great day.